Luke 2. We're going to begin reading there in just a moment. Over the years, Hollywood has produced uh, an untold number of Christmas movies. It seems like every year they churn out another round of them, and uh, very few of them stick around very long. Most of them just kind of come for a little bit, and then they fade fairly quickly. Uh, But a few kind of withstand the test of time, right? And so there's a few classics that just every year you just come back. And the one that's at the top of that list, which you're probably thinking of right now, is It's a Wonderful Life. Wonderful Life seems every year to be the number one movie that people like to watch around Christmas. And I think a lot of it has to do with just the acting job that Jimmy Stewart does. I mean, as George Bailey, he just kind of draws you into his character. You just feel it. And so no matter how many times we've seen the movie, we still end up emotionally invested in his journey, don't we? Emotionally, you know, tied into the story. And I'm always tempted when that film comes on, I just want to skip past all the hard part, right? Do you ever have that temptation where you're like, I just want to get past all the difficult times and all the years because I, I, I don't want to see all that. I want to get to the happy part. I want, I, that's where I want to go. But if you miss out, if you do that, and you miss out of all of his personal sacrifices and all the years of endurance that he has, then you miss out on the things that make the end of that, the payoff in the end so sweet, right? We, we miss it all together. We can't appreciate his overwhelming joy if we haven't gone on the journey with him. And this morning, we're going to meet the real-life equivalent of George Bailey. Luke introduces us to Anna. And even though we only have three verses to get to know her, if we slow down just a little bit and take some time to walk in her shoes, it just may change how we view our own story. So with that in mind, let's look at Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 36. This is the word of the Lord. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up, At that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word in our midst today. So that's it. There's the whole story. That's the whole story of Anna. We have decades of her life summarized in four sentences. And yet Luke packs enough in this small little snapshot to help really draw us into her journey in a profound way. Her tragic backstory, her steadfast hope, and her defining moment, the defining moment we're going to see in a little bit, they all kind of weave together in this story to just create at the very end this joyful explosion. And you can't skip past any of those things. We can't fast forward through any of those things, or we're going to miss out on the things that make the ending so sweet for Anna. And so let's take some time to consider them together. The first part is her tragic backstory, which we find in verse 36 and also the beginning of verse 37. In some ways, Anna's life has begun as a a success story. As we see, she's a prophetess from the tribe of Asher. And today that's a detail that's easy just to really read over. But back then it probably would have raised a few eyebrows because, you see, the tribe of Asher fell along with the northern kingdom, all the other tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel, in 722 B.C., to the Assyrian Empire. So 700 years plus before her tribe had fallen to the Syrians. And you have to know something about the Assyrians. They had something of a toss salad kind of approach. That's how, that's how, they, that's how they ruled peoples when they, when they ca- captured them, conquered them. They would take uh, a group of people out of one nation that they had just conquered and they would drop them in a foreign land and they'd vice versa. They'd pull people out of that land and drop them into, into that nation. And that's what had happened in Samaria, in the capital of Israel. That's, that's what had happened. And so and the point of those things was not, it wasn't a cultural exchange. It wasn't like they were going to learn from each other. There was, they weren't supposed to benefit from each other. This was a cruel practice. And the goal was to erase cultural identity altogether so that it would be easier to keep a, a conquered people in subjugation. That was the aim. That's why they did what they did. 
But for the Jews, though, maintaining this pure you know, ethnic identity is a big deal, right? Because God has made a covenant with the people of Israel. And so to maintain that your identity, your ethnic identity, was a big deal. And so if you've heard about how the Jews of Jesus' day looked down on the Samaritans as kind of half-breeds, well, that's kind of where some of this starts to come from. To, you see why it's a big deal. And so for Anna to still be numbered among the people of God this long after her tribe has fallen and this long after these things have happened to her people, it really is something of a miracle that she's here. And so God has preserved her life and her heritage in a lot of ways. And yet her backstory is also a story of tragedy. She probably comes from a family of some standing. We have her father's name listed, and so we know who he is. She married likely around the young age of 13, which today seems odd. I mean, just sounds really young, but back then it would have been fairly normal. And that's when her story kind of takes a turn for the worse. So you just see this normal trajectory of life. It's just, it, was, it was going exactly according to plan. And yet she's married for seven years, and then <clears throat> suddenly her husband has an untimely death. And at the age of 20, she finds herself as a widow. As best we can tell, there's no, there's no children in the picture at all. So it would have been one of those events that just kind of flips your world upside down. Obviously, there's the sadness and the sorrow and the shock of losing a spouse. But in a male-driven society, it would have been left her, it would have left her in a very vulnerable, extremely vulnerable state. She, on her own, she's left with no way to provide for herself. And yet she has nobody to protect her legally, nobody to protect her physically, and all the things that go along with that, all the, all the chaos that runs into your life with that. That's what the Jewish custom of redemption was created to help with. The brother of the deceased husband, he's supposed to, to marry the widow and bring her into his home in order to, to meet, make sure that her needs are met, but also to preserve his brother's line. And for whatever reason, in this case, nobody has stepped forward to redeem Anna. We don't have her husband's name, so his, his, his line, his lineage hasn't been preserved. And we don't see any children. We see that she remains a widow. And so we don't have any reason to think that anybody even attempted, possibly, to redeem her. So she has little to no control over her circumstances at this point, at all. There's no safety net to catch her. She's on her own. And it's as dire a situation as you could possibly imagine. But, and notice how this one event changes the entire trajectory of her entire life. So her losing her husband changes the Her life is no longer the same as it used to be. In fact, Luke marks that day. He marks from that, that is almost like the defining moment of her life, right? He says she's married for seven years, and then he marks that day of when she became a widow, and he counts forward from there. The beginning of verse 37, it says that she lives as a widow until she was 84. There's two ways to translate that section. Either she lived as a widow until she was 84, or she lived as a widow for 84 years, in which case she'd be well over 100 at this point. Either way, though, the impact doesn't change. At least 60 years, at least 60 years, six decades at least are in that phrase. Six decades of life. And in some ways, this part of the story may even be more excruciating. Imagine what it's like to be her, to have your, your world going one way and then all of a sudden now it's completely going the other. To sit alone every night, to not have from a human perspective an obvious purpose in the world, to not have anything to look forward to in this life. Imagine what 10 years felt like. She watched women who were younger than her kind of pass her by in a stage of life. Or 20 years, or 30 years as you begin to feel just the youth that you used to have start to slip away. Or 40 years, or 50 years, when it's clear your station in life is never going to change. We're supposed to stop. We're supposed to think about what it was like to be her. And all those times, put ourselves in her shoes. All those years of waiting. That should deeply affect us. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to feel what Anna a little glimpse of what Anna had walked through. So that's the backstory that we have to get. We have to get there first. We have to see her suffering, the tragedy that she's walked through. There's simply no way that we can truly appreciate her rejoicing in the temple in the verses that come if we, if we skipped over and fast forward through the storms that she's walked through. So we have to appreciate that. But second, we have to appreciate her steadfast hope. Look at the second half of verse 37. 
She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. Despite all that she'd been through, it's not her past and it's not even her age that defines her at this stage in her life. It's her deep faith, her deep trust and rest in God. Notice how Luke describes her passion for the Lord. She didn't depart from the temple. It's a, it's a way of saying this was her regular pattern of life. And then he adds in at the end, just to make sure we get the point, she didn't depart night and day. Like, just so you know, I mean, when, I, when I say that, I mean it. She was there continually. And it's easy to read that and picture kind of this calm, serene, like Anna's having all day long quiet times, right? She just walks into the temple, floats into the temple, doesn't even have to walk up the steps because of her spirituality. And, and then she's there, and she has this big, long, quiet time with the Lord. But if we root her in history, if we picture it the way it actually was, nothing could be further from the truth. It's helpful to kind of enter the world that she's living in. Religiously, it's been 400 years since the last section of the Old Testament has been written. Since then, there's been no other definitive, thus says the Lord, no other further revelation from God given. Politically, Jerusalem is once again under the control of another empire. This time it's the Romans. And some groups on one end of the spectrum have benefited tremendously from this setup. And then you got guys on the other end of the spectrum who are ready to overthrow these oppressors at the, at, at the drop of a hat. There would have been this bitterly partisan divide along ideological lines. Socially, many people that just seemed interested in, in getting by life. They're only interested in their own situations. They were doing whatever they could to make a little bit of money and try to stay out of Rome's crosshairs. That was the goal of life for a lot of people. They would probably have been a general awareness of God and the things that he had promised and that they should live decent lives. There would have been a, an idea of you should probably go to temple because that's what good Jews do. But understanding how that connects to everyday life, that would have been lost. And all of that, that world, that noisy, busy world would have been drug into the temple on a daily basis where she's in there worshiping. It would have been noisy. It would have been crowded. Needless to say, it wasn't serving very well. The temple at this point in history is not serving very well as a house of prayer for all the nations at all. You've got some people who are going to be there for political gains and to be seen by man. You've got others who have been whipped up into a fervor and they're ready for this this uh, Messiah to appear at any moment and lead a rebellion like a political Messiah against Rome, and he's really going to restore Israel to its glory days. You've got folks that are selling and trading like it's a marketplace. They're able, they see opportunity when they see the temple and people coming and going. You've got a large squ swath of just apathetic people spiritually who just come traipsing in every day so that they can hurry through the motions and get back to what they would consider real life. In the midst of all of that craziness, True spirituality is not easy to find. And yet here's Anna. Here's Anna, worshiping day and night with fasting and prayer. She's not caught up in all the things going on around her. She's not chasing all the things that everybody else is. Her life is marked by a genuine passion for God. She's come to know and she's come to embrace the promises that God has made. She's made them her own and she's eagerly awaiting for their arrival. That's, that's Anna in this age. She's the epitome of a true Israelite, inside and out. Not only could you trace her, her line physically back to Abraham, you can see the spiritual heritage. You can see his traits in her. She's his daughter spiritually. What was said of him proved true of her. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he drew, grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's a description of Anna at this stage in her life. She is fully convinced that God is able to do what he's promised. And as a result, she isn't spending her life trying to chase and fill in all the holes where God's promises are lacking. She's depending on them. That's how she lives her life. She had sought the Lord for years, and it had given her an increased anticipation. It had produced in her life the steadfast hope in God. She'd given attention to preparing to meet Jesus. Like she'd had spent time to get ready for the promised Messiah, and it only increased her gratitude when he arrived. So not only do we need to understand really the tragic backstory that goes with Anna, we also have to really appreciate this steadfast hope that she's displaying in the midst of a tumultuous time 
that she's trusting God's promises. We have to feel the depth of her dependence on the Lord. If we're really going to understand and enter into her joy, we have to feel and appreciate how much she's truly banking on these things being true. But that, those things, those two things, if we really consider those two things, those two things are what make the beginning of verse 38, I think, so spectacular. It makes it so sweet. We have, to, we have to feel those and be in her shoes. This is a brilliant scene, no matter what angle you look at it from. This scene in the temple is brilliant. Luke captures it wonderfully. Not only is it full of theological significance, but it's also this satisfying payoff moment that's been a lifetime in the making. Look at how carefully worded this phrase is. And coming up at that very hour, At that very hour, the death of her husband had been a defining moment in her earthly life. But this right here is the defining moment for Anna. Your translation may say coming up at that very moment. That's a great way of phrasing as well. Either way, the emphasis in the original, Luke's trying to make a point. He wants you to see that the timing of her arrival is no accident. He wants us to see the purpose of behind it. Jesus' parents have brought him to the temple. He's probably about 40 days old at this point. They're offering a sacrifice for Mary's purification. And and Anna just so happens, it just so happens, it's an accident, totally probably, that she walks up at the exact time that a righteous man named Simeon is holding the promised Messiah. And he's prophesying over him, the long way to Messiah. This is going to be the one who brings salvation for the Jews. This is the one who's going to be a light for revelation to the Gentiles. This baby boy. And even though she's in the temple on a daily basis, we've already heard that it's a busy, crowded place. But somehow, somehow, when the Messiah is first publicly announced, she's the one who's there to personally hear it. And so without directly coming out and saying it, he didn't just flat out state it. Luke is implying precisely that God has brought her here in this moment, for this moment. Spurgeon says, God knows how to time what we call our accidental walks. In a single phrase, we catch a glimpse of this hidden hand that's been at work in her life. It's been directing her every step for all of these years to bring her to this moment where she she finally is able to personally encounter Jesus Christ. And the beauty of that revelation has only been magnified by all those experiences. God's been kind to Anna all along. Make no mistake of that. God's, there's hints in that passage leading up to this point. God's been kind to Anna all along, but in a lot of ways it's been a hidden kindness. But now as she sees this baby lying in Simeon's arms, it's not hidden anymore. It's revealed for her to see. And notice this. Everything Everything changed for Anna in that instant. Everything. It serves as one of those just rare tastes of glorification this side of heaven, right? Just by being born, Jesus Christ has radically transformed her life. He hasn't done anything yet. As far as we know, this is the only time that she ever saw Jesus. Based on her age, it's not likely that she was alive when Jesus began his earthly ministry. She never had the benefit of seeing the miracles that he did. She never heard him say anything, let alone praying in Gethsemane. She never got to read the eyewitness accounts, and she wasn't in the upper room when Jesus' disciples came running back to talk about how they had seen an empty tomb. She didn't see him ascend into heaven. But she had seen the Word made flesh. She had seen it, and that was enough for her because she immediately recognized what Christmas meant for her. She immediately recognized it. Look, no one in this life, no one in in her world had stepped forward to redeem her. Nobody had. But this one, this one was the redeemer that came for her to redeem her eternally, her life eternally. She hadn't departed the temple. She'd been there night and day. And yet here was the temple himself that was coming to her, right? Right? Everything changes. Can you imagine the emotions that begin to well up inside as that dawns on her, as that light begins to shine into her heart? All the suffering, all the years of putting her hope in God's word, they didn't just vanish. They weren't masked over. 
Instead, those things made this meeting all the sweeter. And what a moment it produced when she saw him face to face. What a moment when promises were kept and she knew that God had been with her all along. And we aren't left to guess what it, what it did in her heart. Because we see in the second part of verse 38, she began to give thanks. She just began to pour out thanksgiving to God and to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. That's the effect it had on her in that moment. You notice that her response to this Christ child, it's immediate. And the tense in the original is this idea of ongoing. It's an ongoing thing. She didn't just start and then stop giving thanks. She continually is giving thanks. Vertically, she's, she couldn't stop talking about him. She's thanking God for him vertically. Horizontally, she's going around and she's telling others of the hope that she's seen and, and the promises that have been kept and the, and, the, and, the, and the witness and the testimony is pouring out of her. She can't help it. She can't help but talk about it. And that's the way that we leave Anna. That's the last that we see of her. She's going around thanking God and telling everyone, particularly those who are waiting for his redemption, about what she's found. That's the legacy that we see that she has left behind. And that's wonderful because ultimately, that's what Jesus Christ came to do for all of us. He came to create a people who leave a legacy of overflowing gratitude, and they're delighting together in the gospel. That's what we are. That's what we're called to be together as a church. And so as we turn the page on this Advent season and we mentally start to gear up for 2019, Anna is still speaking to all of us today. All of us who are, if you're awaiting the redemption, she's talking to you. She's inviting you, she's inviting all of us to come in and to find the same gratefulness, to find the same delight that she did. Her legacy is teaching us how. So we want to consider a few of those. First, Anna teaches us that joy in Christ will have the last say for the Christian. Anna teaches us that joy in Christ will have the last say for the Christian. Some of you have experienced things and faced things over the course of this past year that you were not expecting. Like Anna, they've kind of turned, they've rocked your world. They've turned it upside down. And I'm not talking about just momentary bumps in the road that you're able to recover from kind of quickly. You just swerve around and keep going. Talking about things that drive you off the road. The things that not only hurt in the moment, but they also have this effect of being just almost life-altering. The trajectory of your life was going one way, and because this event happened, it's never going to be the same. That kind of event. In the midst of that darkness, it's, it's really, honestly, it's hard to see how in the world any sliver of good can come out of that. Let alone how that could increase your joy in Christ. What, this is a question. Have you ever asked this question? What possible blessing can come from this? What possible blessing could ever come from this? That I get. That I can see a purpose in. But this, what possible purpose, what good could come from this? Maybe that's something that you're even having to wrestle with right now. That's a question that the holidays may have even brought back into your mind. Maybe it was something that happened in the past and the holidays have brought it back. Truth be told, from a human perspective, we're never going to be able to put all the pieces together. We're never going to be able to see the whole puzzle. In a broken world, a lot of our experiences are going to end up in this heap of things that don't make sense. They just don't make sense. And yet it's clear, it's clear from this text that God saw the tragedy that Anna walked through as extremely precious. Her sufferings were more valuable in his sight than she could have ever recognized in that moment. Even trying to understand the purpose, she didn't understand the purpose, but he sees value in it. Because there's a direct connection. This text makes a direct connection between her experience of suffering, the tragedy of her story, and her overflowing joy at seeing Jesus Christ. There is a direct connection here. We can't miss that. There were other people in the temple that day, and they missed Jesus altogether. And a lot of the reason that they did is because they hadn't suffered in the way that she had. They hadn't longed for redemption. They didn't even know what it was, but she knew what it was, and she wanted it. She longed for it. She's the one, when she saw him, she truly saw him. She truly understood what his birth meant. 
In no way does this minimize her suffering. In no way does this minimize your suffering. It doesn't flatten out all of our, our human experiences into this mold where it's assembly line and everything just looks the same, and that's the explanation for everything. But, but it, does instill, it does instill in our losses, our hurts, with an eternal purpose. It gives it to them, an eternal purpose and a divine value. Things that we can't even see now, God is intending to use that. He's intending to use those things. In his infinite wisdom, God wants to use your suffering today to increase your joy in his son. He wants to do that in your life. Those who are in the darkest night, listen to this, those who are in the darkest places are the people best positioned to see the first ray of dawn. In the darkest night, you, you're, the, you're the first one to see it coming. Look at how the Apostle Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 4. I love this verse. Verse 17, he says, For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us. It's preparing. It's working for us. It's, God has, has made it our servant. He's made your affliction your servant. It's working for us. It's preparing for us. What is it preparing? An eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Beyond all comparison. God plans to make the sufferings that we experience to ultimately point us to greater joy in Jesus Christ. That's what he intends to do. Those things that had defined our life up until a point The reason that they're still included in this story is they serve a point, but they don't define the life anymore. Anna's life is now defined by this moment. And those things contributed to this moment, and that's why they're still in the story. They're not going to have final say over your life. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, they are not going to have final say over your life. He will, and it will be joy in him. Second, Anna teaches us that we should orient our hope around Christ's coming. Anna teaches us we should orient our hope around Christ's coming. It's easy. It's easy in our day to not be ready for the return of Christ. To put it another way, to kind of flip it around, it's hard in our day to be ready for the return of Christ. It requires effort and work to set our hope on that. But the reward in the end comes all the sweeter for those who do. Because you see, our, our times, they're not that much different than Anna's, right? We live in a, in a world with distractions and dangers and, and, and all, everything ready to pull us one direction or another, much like the world she lived in. And that's why her simple way of living is a much-needed correction for us as Christians today. Looking for Christ's return, it, re- it requires a, self, a sort of self-denial. It requires a perseverance of us. And those are two things that naturally, as humans, we're not inclined to do, and especially as Americans, we are not inclined to do. We want it now, and we want it our way. It's not in our sinful nature, nor is it part of our self-indulging environment to get ready for the return of Jesus. But the things that we're called to as Christians that seem kind of odd in the minds of those around us and may even feel a little bit odd in our own minds, those a lot of times are the things that we especially need to pay attention to because those are the areas and those are the, area, the habits that we most need to develop. They may be the areas that we most need help in, to grow in. Notice here that there are two specific habits that Luke mentions about Anna that seem to have pushed back this shallowing effect in Anna's life. They've, they've sort of served as a, a force that's able to push back on some of those things. Fasting and prayer. Those are the two things he lists specifically for her. And the fruit of those things have helped her to slow down and to genuinely taste the joys of this next life. That's, that's what it, those things do. They helped, her, they helped her and they help us become content in a lot of ways. And it clearly didn't have access to a lot of the material possessions that people felt like were necessary at the time. But yet in her mind, she lacked nothing. And at the same time, those disciplines, they helped her to become discontent in a lot of ways. She wasn't satisfied anymore. 
She wasn't willing to settle for the temporary trappings of the world. She had already seen the end of those things, and she knew there was no genuine hope in them. She was going to continue to seek until she found what God had promised, the things that she knew she could bank on. So orienting our lives around Christ's coming means that we actually take some time and some effort to really get ready for it. Like practically, in your calendar, we, we make time to get ready for his return. To be fully convinced that God is going to do just what he said he was going to do. It's been two millennia since Jesus ascended back up into heaven and said he's going to return. But it's no less certain that he will. And Christians, we are called in every generation to be ready. We're called to be ready. Habitual prayer and fasting, th those things can really help our spiritual appetites for his return. To, they, they want our hearts to grow, be ready to embrace Jesus when we see him, because that day is coming, and it may come quicker than we expect. It's a regular habit of seeking the Lord in these ways that helped orient Anna towards the things that matter, towards the first coming of Christ. She was ready for him when he came. In the early church, they had similar practices. You can read about prayer and fasting being a regular spiritual discipline in the early church. And many Christians around the world, they're doing that even today, seeking and through the help of the Holy Spirit, those things are supposed to have the same effect for us here in Round Rock. We aren't meant to actively, we as a church, this is part of our calling, we're meant to actively be participating in the confession of the, of the universal church. When it says, amen, come Lord Jesus. As a church, we're intended to participate in that. And as Christians and in our homes, we're intended to actually be actively participating and making that same confession. And one of the ways that we do that is through prayer and fasting. Maybe as a believer... You've known the promises of God for a long time. But somewhere along the way, the immediate joy and the desire for heaven just begins to fade, kind of into the background. Rigors of daily life, ease of living, distraction of busyness. What, what, what am I going to do tonight? What am I going to do tomorrow? Just that kind of living. All those things can begin to dull our affections for Jesus. And I'd like to suggest that it's very possible that lack, when we lack prayerful meditation on scripture, when we lack, an, there's an absence of fasting in our lives, that leaves that door wide open to let those things kind of creep in and begin to crowd out the love that we first had for Jesus. Prayer isn't a magical formula, and fasting isn't an attempt to earn God's favor back. But both of those things, both of those practices, they're meant to increase our anticipation of seeing Jesus. That's what they're meant to produce in our lives. If you're saying, hey, I don't, that's not necessarily something that I would characterize as, as front and center in my life. I don't really think about his return. And I haven't oriented, I wouldn't call my life oriented around him coming back. Those two disciplines can begin to help you to think of it in those terms, to see things that way. John Piper captures the fasting of Anna this way. Are we settled into the world so comfortably that the thought of fasting for the end of history is almost unthinkable? What about older people? Can you taste the glories of the presence of the king better because they are near? Do you turn that taste into fasting for the king's coming? What about younger people? Do you love Jesus so much that his coming would be the greatest thing that you can imagine? Or is he a kind of weekend topic of religious talk that sometimes helps you with a bad conscience, but he isn't someone you would want to interrupt your life? What about those of us in the middle or pushing the upper end of the middle? How do we feel about being told that fasting may reflect how much we want the bridegroom to come? Does Anna's passion for the Messiah appeal to us at all? Do we want the appearance of Jesus more than we want to finish our career plans. When Jesus comes, we want to be a people who are ready for his appearing. We want to be like Anna. And as a pastoral team, we felt that this was such an important point. We're going to spend next week's message really on the purpose and, and the priority of fasting in our midst as a church. We're going to talk about what practically that's going to look like in, in, in 2019 in the life of our church. There's going to be time built into the calendar to do that. This night of prayer, this is an opportunity to do exactly that, to ask Jesus to come. 
Because here's the thing. The Lord is not slow to keep his promises, as some consider slow. If we live our lives oriented this way, it may look weird. In fact, it will look weird. There's no way around it. You're going to be kind of weird. You're going to be one of those weird Christians. There's the normal Christians, and then there's the weird Christians. You're going to be one of those. It will seem naive to the world around us. Slowing down to peer into the next life, to even think about it, doesn't feel that productive. But imagine going on a vacation that you know is coming, and you spend no time getting ready for it. Nothing. How productive is that trip? If there's a world coming, if there's a world coming, it doesn't feel productive. But if there truly is a world coming, then maybe it is. Listen, if Jesus wasn't coming, then no, it's not. If he didn't make that promise, then we have no reason to, to do these things. But in a moment, Scripture says, in the twinkling of an eye, the sweetest payoff that the world has ever known will suddenly appear for those who have set their hope on God. moment that I enjoy probably the most at the end of It's a Wonderful Life is, and if you've seen the film, you know what I'm talking about, to when he's crying, saying, I want to live again. And the snow just begins to start to fall, and Bedford falls again. And it dawns on him that he's alive. It clicks for George. And he can't help himself anymore, right? He just starts running, I mean sprinting, and with tears of joy just streaming down his face, he's yelling to everybody that he can possibly see, Merry Christmas! That's what he's yelling over and over again. He's yelling to buildings. He's yelling to people he, doesn't even, he didn't even like. Suddenly, he sees reasons everywhere to be thankful for his life, the life that he had, even for the hard things. And that is exactly what Emmanuel does for us. That's what he does for your life. That's what Jesus does for your life. If you're wondering what that means for your life, that's what he does. That's what he did for Anna. That's what he does for you. Listen, Anna had no idea that morning. She didn't know when she woke up that today was the day. Today was the day that she was going to see Jesus. She didn't know that she was finally going to see him face to face. She didn't know that there was going to be a payoff the way that we're seeing it. She had no idea the surprise that God had waiting for her, that he was delighting to bring her into. She'd had tastes. She'd seen glimpses, enough things to keep her going. But seeing the Redeemer right there in front of her eyes was more than she imagined. And she ran, the equivalent, she became George Bailey, right? She ran from one place to the next to tell everyone to thank God and to tell everyone what she'd seen. That experience, when you watch that film next time, remember this, that experience isn't fictional. It's not actually, it's not made up. Hollywood didn't come up with it. And it's also, it's not meant for Anna alone. It wasn't intended for just one person to experience. One day, all believers, all believers are going to have an even richer experience. And somehow, Somehow, in in God's power and in his wisdom and in his grace, all the burdens, all the sacrifices, all the hoping and the fasting and the prayer, they won't be swept under the rug. They won't disappear into oblivion as if they didn't serve a purpose. They're going to be redeemed. They're going to be redeemed in the sweetest, most wonderful, wisest way possible. Because Emmanuel has come. And he's promised to come again. They're going to be transformed into these glistening crowns. That we will have the delightful privilege of laying at our Redeemer's feet, the one who died for you, scarred feet. As we finally get to experience his presence and understand what he was doing all along and see his glory on full display and not have to worry ever again with him. God with us, Emmanuel, will be home. And there's going to be no greater ending than that. Let's pray.